yes, welcome everyone. Uh, currently I'm doing the welcome and introduction, which is fairly normal. So I hope a few more people are going to join a bit later on, but uh, it's good to see all of you here and thanks very much for joining in this group. Uh, we're going to kick off with Vince in a minute, uh, talking about Inspector Pro, and I'm pretty excited to hear the new features in 7.1. Uh, and then Diego is going to talk about all the things I wish someone had told me 30 years ago. And I'm expecting to find quite a thing, few things in there that I wish someone had told me. Um, hopefully Ian's going to join us in a bit and bravely launch into some live coding with uh, Core ML, creating a model. And uh, then uh, we're going to have a talk from John about Node Red. Um, which I'm interested to hear about, very interested to hear about. And then we'll end up with, a, we'll have a 10 minute break at the end, about nine o'clock. And because of people's interests and timings, I'm going to try and stick to the timings. We'll see how that goes. And then uh, after the all the discussions, we'll have a, uh, a question and answer session about, well, not a question and answer, just an open discussion about uh, the recent uh, Caris Engage. So uh, usual usual rules or requests, uh, mute when you're not talking, um, especially when presentations are going. If you want to ask questions, uh, stick them in the chat if they're getting to be many, but we can try doing them live if they're not too many. Um, and presenter, presenters are happy with that. So presenters do please say if you're not. Uh, and let's go because uh, it's boring listening to me waffling and let's let's hear from Vince if you're ready are you ready Vince I will stop presenting Vince are we yours mate All right, hand the baton over to you hi everyone <clears throat> and welcome to this uh, tour for inspector 7.1 my name is Vincenzo Manano I'm from beeswax and in this uh, uh, short video We'll cover some of the new features in 7.1, and I'll give you a, kind of a behind the scenes look at, at Inspector 7.1 in different areas. So let's get started. Uh, the agenda for this uh, video is uh, we'll, we'll go look at uh, progressive dashboard that's been added in 7.1. Uh, we've changed some of the Slack notifications. We also support uh, enable series shortcut donations. So if you have scripts that are donated to shortcuts, you'll see them uh, with a little microphone icon. We have uh, this cool thing, script monitor. Uh, you know, a video is worth a thousand words, so we'll, we'll, we'll see that in action uh, in, our, in a short video in a moment. We have the ability to add tags to any item and search on tags. We have Logicator. Uh, support for searching uh, in a specific area and we also have global searching so we'll cover both of those and we have this area called extra information which is kind of gathering and cross-referencing information about a solution so that you don't have to go hunting for it okay so uh, this is the progressive dashboard in 7.1 and uh, on the left side uh, this side would be a list of solutions. I only have one solution listed in here. And these were different snapshots of DDRs I took of Inspector in the process of development. And we'll see that uh, over time, uh, we increase code and we introduce a lot of errors. And, and then we make a concerted effort to start cleaning up the errors and, and, uh, and then ship uh, problem free. Um, but, but this is a great way to get an overall picture of the solution um, as it progresses. So you can keep a close eye on if, you, if you're starting off with a lot of problems and you want to whittle them down, it's a great way to, to kind of visually see the progress there. Um, we also have Slack support. So we had Slack support, but in this new version 7.1, we introduced the ability to send Slack notifications when problems are fixed and when notes are added. So, uh, so this is helpful for when you collaborate with a team to keep your team informed as to the, uh, the things that are going on in a solution. 
well, like I mentioned before, we have the ability to see when a script is donated for uh, shortcuts. And I keep wanting to say Siri shortcuts, but uh, really shortcuts. And um, this is a FileMaker 19 feature, and you can also search on that flag as well. <clears throat> uh, this is something uh, that is kind of um, an extension of some of the visualization work that we've been doing for many years. But we've introduced this new thing called Script Monitor, and what it is is uh, the ability to generate uh, a small file that is a representation of the scripts that you want to monitor. And when you uh, make some changes in your scripts to call uh, a single script that will then invoke uh, the node, the particular node, to light up when the script is called. So this best is demoed in, in, in action. So let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. So let's say I look at uh, script monitor and I look at event management. So this uh, we took this example off of uh, uh, the Claris web page and downloaded it and then generated a DDR and uh, ge generated a, a D3 visualization from it in Inspector. And there's instructions on how to do this. And when you save out this file, it's just a standalone file, and you can put this file anywhere. And you then uh, customize the script that then uh, is able to communicate with this file. In your script, all you need to do is add these, uh, this, this call to script monitor and script monitor will do the rest of the work. And, um, <clears throat> and so when, a, when, when scripts are called, it lights up the nodes of, uh, of the scripts that are, that are called. So like if I go into here and I run a particular script, uh, you'll see that it lights up different nodes that, of the scripts that are being triggered for that action. So pretty cool. Uh, and, and very easy to do uh, with, with Inspector 7.1. So uh, next we go to tags, and you can add tags to a single uh, item that is selected or to a found set um, or um, also across the solution. So the, uh, the tags can be... Um, uh, chosen in terms of the style or color, and they can also have um, a URL associated with them. And uh, very easy to do. Basically, you just select the row, and then you click on the Tags button. You'll get this dialog come up, and you type in your information for your tag here, and then choose whether you want to add it for the current record of found set, and you click Add. So that's a good way to keep your team informed. And when tags are attached to items, you see a little tag icon on the row on the, on the right there. Um, we also have Logicator support. And Logicator support lets you uh, basically pick a field you want to search on and uh, specify whether it starts with, ends with, contains, and type in the search string you're looking for and then click Find. Now, Logicator support is for um, specific areas like fields and layouts and scripts and, and that kind of thing. And particularly useful when you have a lot of attributes in a particular table like fields or layout objects uh, because um, looking for the field on the layout may be a rather frustrating experience for some. So we've uh, chosen to add this um, <clears throat> support for Logicator built in. We also have global search, and I'll cover that when we go into the tour of the product. Um, extra information, this is kind of a cool new capability. Basically, um, over about uh, over 100 for sure. I think it's around 120 different areas where we uh, normalize information for you so you don't have to go looking for it. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. Uh, where that, that is very useful. Um, here's one actually here, uh, layout destination. There's the different types of ways that you could go to layouts, like go to original layout, go to, buy, go to 
um, a, a specific layout, like specifying the layout itself. Um, go to layout name by calculation, go to layout number by calculation, and go to current layout. Now, if you had a layout that was not referenced um, anywhere and you'd think, okay, well, I could delete this layout, uh, you might want to cross check uh, your information with this list of, in, of um, choices just to make sure that uh, you aren't using any indirection and layout, go to layout name by calculation and go to layout number by calculation are both different methods of uh, indirection. So this gives you an ability to, you know, if you've inherited something or haven't looked at something in a while, it gives you that information at your fingertips. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, we covered progressive dashboard, Slack notifications, shortcuts. Um, uh, we covered script monitor, tags, logicator, and extra information. Let's take a, a quick tour of, um, of the solution. And uh, so we, we showed you the script monitor here. So, <clears throat> so, here's, um, so here's Inspector. And I have... Uh, loaded different solutions in here and uh, as you can see the the, the progressive dashboard uh, kind of comes to life when you have at least you know a few different analyses in there and you can see you know as code increases uh, some problems get introduced etc so a great way to um, to stay informed as to what's happening uh, let's take a look at a large system and what I'm going to do in particular, so I'm going to dive into uh, layouts and styles for layouts. Uh, but just a quick word here about this view. Everything you see here is like a, it's like a dashboard. You'll have them uh, grouped together like schema, layouts, uh, scripts, security. And uh, on the on the right hand side, you have the total number of items. If um, you know an area has problems you'll have a warning triangle if um, for example uh, you have uh, let's say layouts here 987 of them um, we have 317 layouts that don't have any references so they're they're unreferenced and that's 32 percent of them uh, so this gray bar shows you at a glance when you're looking at this whole window uh, areas of your solution that may be dormant or unreferenced. So let's dive into layouts. And uh, th this is uh, subsummarized by database and then uh, the layout, layout name here. Um, and then the table for the context of the layout is showing up over here and uh, the number of objects, the theme, the layout group it's in, and, um, and if it has triggers, the width of the layout, and if it has dependencies or references. Now, um, when it comes to styles, uh, we're in a, in a section for layout called general, but if we switch over to styles, we see a whole different view, but the same, the actual um, same layouts, right so we have the same layouts listed here uh, we have a layout here uh, this one here that has 681 objects on it and if we move from left to right we'll see default styles and we'll see 16 of the objects have a default style uh, so basically very very little percentage we'll see 354 of the objects actually have a theme style so uh, they went through the effort to actually create create a style save it to the layout and save it into the theme and uh, and so that's what that's what's showing here we have one object that didn't make it make it all the way over and then we have um, the other 50 percent of the objects another 310 objects that um, uh, got modified but never same, saved it to any theme. And, th and that's got a little more overhead for the, the server to do more work to send to the client every time uh, someone uh, loads the information on this layout. So uh, Inspector helps highlight 
those uh, those areas and not only that if I click here I get taken to all 310 of those objects I can see where it is uh, by the location and I could go then um, into that layout uh, go find that object and save it into um, into a style Let's look at, um, let's go back to the dashboard and let's look at problems. Now, you can get to a list of problems in two ways, from, from the, the analysis dashboard or from this main window dashboard. I can pop over and open the list of problems here, um, or I can do that the same by clicking on this uh, problem icon over here to see all the problems. Uh, we're going to look at a smaller solution that has fewer problems. And this one here has just, um, let's see, it has a smaller number of problems. And, and, and basically, um, <clears throat> this view here subsummarizes uh, by area. So we're looking at layout objects. And there's a button at this location that had a script, but the script is missing. And uh, <clears throat> just to show you the integration with Slack, behind here I have my Slack window. And uh, if I were to go into this system and fix this problem, I could mark it as fixed. And what we would see here is um, a message went out into the Slack channel telling uh, users on my team that that problem was fixed. So uh, very handy. We also show some additional information uh, if a problem is dormant. So here's a script step that has been disabled. And, and there is still a problem here. However, um, the, uh, the step is disabled. So um, it's highlighting that with a little coffee cup and graying um, the information out on the row. So that's some um, problems. And that's very, uh, very useful here. So let's look at, um, let's look at searching. So let's say I go back into this large system and I want to do a search um, in here for a string, let's say the word, e the word email, and I'll find everywhere where that, where that string is used. Um, this will search in schema or calculations, or you can choose, I just you just want to search in calculations. And uh, when I say calculations, I mean every single calculation in, in your solution. Um, it's all normalized in one table, and so it gives you a, a quick search in, in there. And so if I search uh, for email, uh, what it'll give me back is every single place it found the word email. And, um, and you'll see here, it found a lot of references, 125 fields found. Um, and uh, <clears throat> these, these fields here um, show the word email in them. However, I'm only showing the first 10. And if I want to expand it, I just simply click expand. And then it'll be looking at all the, uh, the 125 here that have that, um, that string of email in them. Same thing with layout objects and um, and uh, relationships, etc. So um, searching is really easy to do, and um, uh, gives you the ability to drill in and uh, and search for those items. If you want to see it in context, so for example, a reference in this script step at, at uh, this one here. Step 36, I could click here. It will drill back into the solution, uh, into this, and sorry, into the uh, script steps for that script and highlight the script where the, uh, the string was found. So very, very powerful feature. Um, so that's searching. We have manual references. Let's take a look at uh, manual references here. Let's say, uh, again, looking at a layout, Let's say I had this layout, and this layout um, tells me here I have zero references. There's no references where this, um, this layout is in use. However, if I were to use this layout for a data API call, or let's say some other purpose, um, 
where I'm, I'm needing the layout, but it's called from an external system. Um, any, 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 uh, um, any schema element in Inspector has the ability to attach what is called a manual reference. And that's up here on the uh, right. And I can click there and I can enter, um, you know, some information. Do not delete um, used by data API. And I can attach it to the current record. And now I have a manual reference, right? And that manual reference will be tracked from one analysis to the next. So if I bring in another analysis of the system, it knows that that item had some references to it and it will carry those references forward. So once you enter it, you never have to enter it again. Uh, same thing goes for notes. If I add a note, um, a note here and I add a note, I'll see a little note icon show up over here and uh, telling me that there is, a, that there is a manual, there's a note that's been added to this item. Again, notes will carry forward, tags will carry forward, manual references will carry forward, um, and, uh, and, and tags and um, notes are also uh, able to, to search on those, so not a problem. Um, let's look at, uh, let's go back and look at that small demo. And um, one other thing, when you run an analysis um, and you, you bring in um, a new analysis, you have three options you can pick. Uh, calculate MD5 for comparison purposes. Uh, <clears throat> gather extra information or generate table distance. Now, um, uh, the generate table distance will give you the ability to do this. Let me see here. Let me go to uh, layout objects. And here's all my objects by subsummarized by layout. And you'll notice here if I went to see only the objects for this layout, you'll notice that in this column, um, there is a letter D, the number of table occurrence hops that this field or portal needs to uh, resolve. So this field um, that is on this layout comes from six hops away. So this is uh, a great way to, to look at solutions that might not be optimal and, and be informed of, of such, um, such uh, things that could cause some problems there. So that's, um, that's table distance. Uh, we covered Logicator. Uh, search uh, and we covered uh, global search. I think the last thing I would just like to cover to show you is um, references. Let me look at fields and to get to fields I could go list all the fields or I could go to base tables and here's all my my base tables and I could go look at let's say this table and I could go into the fields for that table and I can see here this, uh, this field, ID node related, has 52 references. And uh, you'll see them listed here and they're subsummarized by area. You'll notice that uh, we have these little green targets. And let's say uh, you were particularly interested in where the data is being modified for this field. So uh, these green targets kind of surface the possibility that data could be changed. So this field on this uh, on this layout at this location is enterable. So uh, we show you a green target. We also have green targets when the field itself is the target. And so this field is being set in at this step 41. If I click on it, uh, sure enough, it goes to that um, step and shows me the uh, the field in question and and that's uh, showing me that that's that's where that field is actually being modified so if if that's my interest uh, these green targets help you narrow in to the places where uh, you need to look at and pay attention so that's uh, that's that's references and I'll I'll, I'll close with uh, 
one important point, and that is, um, let's see here, if I go back to layouts, so layouts, and we have on the far right, we always have either a column for dependencies uh, or a column for references uh, or uh, one or the other, but in some cases we have both. So layouts have dependencies and references. And so in this case, I have uh, this layout depends on seven things and it depends on the custom menu set, uh, a layout group it belongs in or depends on this table that um, it's bound to this layout, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, uh, dependencies are not as critical as references. So, if I were to delete this layout, it would not affect, you know, this. Um, let's say this table. It would have no effect on the table. However, if I go to um, uh, references and I were to delete this layout then it would break these two buttons and it would break all these other script steps because they're they're they are actually referencing this layout and so those those things would break um, so that's kind of a a quick rough tour of uh, of this version here and uh, uh, you know we do have a trial version on our on our website that you can download uh, for two weeks, fully working, and uh, the the product is uh, for uh, this period of time has a, a reduced price of uh, three ninety five. It's usually four ninety five. I'll kind of stop there and take on any questions, uh, cognizant of time. Um, happy to answer any questions anybody has. I, I have one that I'll ask straight away, which is um, on a very large system. What is the the load time of a a, a DDR file? So if you've got something with thousands of data, like if we're talking thousands of layouts, um, yeah. So this system, and hundreds of layouts. So how does it work? Right? It, what's the sort of performance of it? So. Yeah, it's not it's not the fastest. However, I will say two things. We are we are we are currently using. So this, this is a large system. It's got 12 databases. It's got half a million elements in all, maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, it took about an hour and a little bit to process. Um, okay. And, and um, uh, I will say this, that this is using the current XML. FileMaker has save as XML, which is considered XML 2.0. And um, that's in a different format. And... Um, uh, you know, none of none of the vendors, myself or Base Elements or FM Perception, are able to support it because it doesn't have the breakdown of calculations like this version has. So once they once they they move to that to to build support for that, we'll be able to switch over. And there's some really exciting plans that we have for when we switch over. There's, it's a completely different architecture, and there's some really exciting stuff uh, that's going to be enabled. Uh, okay. So performance-wise, there may be some exciting news. Fair enough. Cool. Anyone uh, else got any questions? Again, the collaboration features. Fine, yeah, just, just unmute yourself and ask questions now if you want to, guys. Hey, Vince, just um, a quick question. Uh, you mentioned tagging and notes. Um, so I'm assuming this is living yeah. with the analysis itself, right? Yeah, is uh, is not carry it does not carry over like one analysis to the next or yeah tag, or tagging like that. Will, tagging and notes will carry over yeah oh wow so I could okay yeah, so like if I add if I add a you know let's say I I want to you know maybe put a tag on here say optimize this script or something like that and uh, so say optimize uh, and I add that tag to this current record so I have a tag now. And so whenever I run the import again, that tag will carry for, and I can search the notes, I can search the tags, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, once Sweet. you've done it, it's just there, yeah. And you, me you mentioned also uh, search, and I'm, I'm curious, yeah. um, is it including or disregarding the uh, stuff like uh, script comments and calculation comments? Uh, uh, 
Yeah, uh, comments for sure are included. Script comments, I can't remember. I believe, okay. uh, well, it's, it's searching the script text. So it's searching the entire script text. So I, 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 I believe it's in there, yeah. So would have to be included. would be part of that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's, that's cool. Thanks, that's, that's great. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. That's, uh, that's great. That was really interesting and fascinating. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I would, I would love to follow up with the recording and listen to what others are presenting. I just have to leave. I have another engagement. That's no fine. Problem. All right, Vin. Thanks for your time, Vin. Um, everyone. Wonderful. Bye. Cheers, Vin. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Great. So we should be uh, moving on, if you're ready, to Diego without any uh, keeping uh, on the schedule. We're actually bang on schedule at the moment, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, unless anyone's got any other comments to make before we start with you, Diego, um, I'll hand it over to you. So just shout out quickly if you've got any comments. No, all good, guys. Good to go, Diego. OK. Hi, everybody. Greetings from South America. My name is Diego. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And despite that I'm from Argentina, I know nothing about football. So, you know, it's it's like I, I tell everybody that I'm from Argentina and they go right away, okay, Maradona, Messi, and I'm like, okay, I'm glad you like them. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm into cars, so uh, a, a completely different sport. Uh, so, Good man, it's sometimes slightly alarming when you don't get any feedback. So I'm going to let you know we can all hear you. <laughs> okay. So, well done, Joe. <laughs> so tell me if, if you're seeing my screen right now. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, many, many of you we've met on DevCons uh, before. Uh, but quick, you know, introduction. I'm a FineMaker developer since I was 15 years old. That that was back in 1990. Uh, I've been a speaker on on the Latin American track uh, for many years. I was a speaker on the main track of DevCon uh, on 17 and 18. Um, I'm a certified FileMaker developer, Scrum master. I have a master degree in legal computer forensics, which sounds like I'm a CSI or something like that. And believe me, it's way much boring than all that. Um, I had a company uh, that was uh, mainly focused in doing a FileMaker solution, and I had I, I work with many Fortune 500 companies. And right now, I'm the CTO at Sagai, which is the Actors uh, Rights, Rights Management Association here in Argentina. And the, the, the idea of, of this presentation, I, I was talking with Gary earlier today. Um, I've been reading, you know, in a lot of forums and during the past Clarice Engage that I realized that there are, I, I don't know where, where are you coming from uh, as, as developers, but I realized that due to the COVID crisis, uh, a lot of citizen developers started, you know, like getting more interested in becoming uh you know, full-time developers and, and, and started to become, you know, uh, to order to sell solutions or to become, you know, consultants. And uh, I, I've been in those shoes many years ago. Um, you know, I have my ups and downs and, and I really wanted to share, you know, this, this presentation, is, it's, a, it's a refurbished version of the one I did on DevCon in 2018, 
but I, I grab like like the things that I think that might be important for the world that we are, you know, in, in which we are right now. So um, this graph here, it's like my my year, yearly income. And as you can see, you know, uh, FindMaker has been a part of my life. Uh, you know, um, th there are, I, I put on some highlights that when I finished high school, when I got married, when my son was born, when I bought my house. And, and as you can see, my, my income uh, flow was always like, you know, despite some crisis and some ups and downs, it was always going up until in January of 2012, I had a night, an accident with my bike. And the short story is that I ended uh, in bankrupt. So, you know, at, at that moment, I, I spent almost six months in ICU and, and everything, you know, crumbled and went down. Um, I, I, you know, I, I even got, you know, uh, troubles with the with the banks and, and they started closing my account. So, so it was really, you know, a very, very bad year. Um, you know, we almost lost the house. So, you know, everything that could be going wrong went wrong. And there was a moment that, you know, I realized that if, if I don't learn from, from what's going on right, right now and from this experience, then I'm not the smartest person uh, around, you know? So I, I started like writing down, okay, what went wrong? Um, I, I don't know how many of you here are independent developers? Just shout or say. Yeah, that's me. Okay. There's a few others, I think. Okay. Yeah, so okay so, so so i guess that many of you are are on this wheel right now so so you know uh you you you, you deliver uh some 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 part of of your solution and you know and, and you have bills to pay, and then you send the invoice, and then you deliver, and then you have to pay the bills, and then you send the invoice, and you are always, you know, in this circle. And if if you have more clients, and if you want to get more money, then you have to repeat this circle as many times as current clients you are having. So the thing is that if you are in this wheel, and this wheel, something happens, as it, it happened to me, then the whole wheel crumbles, and then everything falls apart. So it's like, uh, you know, I, I always say that it, that it's, staying in business was like juggling with fire, uh, you know, with your eyes covered under a meteor storm, and your life depending on it. So, so that was like the sensation I, I, I was having. And, you know, um, due to this, it's like I, I said that I can write an encyclopedia of mistakes. And I have my little hand, handbook and not, notebook of achievements because, yeah, I like myself. So I, I always like to write nice stuff about me. Just a few things. So, uh, this is the story of uh, how I came with the with the concept of you know having healthy or unhealthy development processes. Um, this is the true story, you know, uh, and, and a, an example of an unhealthy development process that you know it began with a meeting and everyone was happy and everything was going okay, and a couple of months later I ended up on the floor. Uh, you know, and almost six months in ICU. And the story behind these photographs, 
the one of the meeting is of, of course uh, you know stock footage footage the other one uh it's a real one and so so this is what happened uh try to follow the lines you know it started with a meeting i got the requirements i did the quoting i started coding then i got some feedback and you know then I got more requirement and I started getting a list of pending items. I fixed those errors. I was getting more requirement. I was fixing the old and new errors. And, you know, then I got more requirements. Uh, then I was, you know, having a, uh, I was stuck in a bug with, with a bug. And I was like, you know, handling all, all these errors. And I was so stressed out and I was riding my bike. I didn't see that there was a bump on the road and I ended up on the floor. So uh, this is what the unhealthy development process I was on back at that time. Um, on the contrary, um, then I realized that I, I could be working on a healthier development process that starts with a meeting, I get the requirements, I estimate the effort, and, and, and this is the complete game changer. When, when you estimate the effort, then I do the quoting, and then I deliver the MVP. MVP is, here stands for minimum viable product. So once I deliver the MVP, I get more requirements, I discuss what items are on the backlog, then I re-estimate the effort, and then I deliver the next MVP. And this cycle goes on and on and on. And as a result, you know, I get happy customers, and I'm able to pay the bills, and I have a more predictable income. So um, comparing one development process with the other, I would say that, you know, with the unhealthy methods, the, the cons are, you know, delays. If because if, if you get, get stuck with a project, all of all your other projects, you know, start like also getting delayed. Uh, your clients might get impatient, you get you get stressed, and with this methodology, it's also difficult to add new members to your team, you know, with the unhealthy method. Uh, really, I, I can't think of any pros with, with this kind of, of uh, working methodology. On, on the other side, uh, with the healthy method, you have schedules that are easy to maintain. And the fact that you can provide improvements to your clients on a regular basis uh, makes your cash flow more predictable. And it's also, you know, uh, a way uh, to work with new developers uh, in, an, in an easier way. So I, I don't know how many of you uh, are using Agile right now with FileMaker. So. No. No? Okay. So. So we can go through a very um, uh, we, we, we're going to cover some basic uh, concepts about agile. Um, so we have different ways to think about our product. So let's say that the we, we go to a meeting and on our our customer tells us, okay, I want you to build something that takes me from place A to place B. Uh, so on, on a regular or, or a, or a you know, non-agile uh, methodology, which is the one that I call the unhealthy methodology, uh, on, on your first iteration, uh, because you you know that that at the end of the, of the day you are going to build a car, okay? Okay, so you go and and, and you uh, prepare a, a wheel and you go 
you have a meeting and you present the wheel and they like it and they say, okay, this is great. And on the second one, uh, you go and you present the two wheels and, and the chassis of the car. And it's like, okay, it's good. And then on the third one, you, you present the body of the car. And once you get approved, then you assemble everything and you deliver the car. But only on the last step, you are delivering the car. So your end user so, or your customer will get the final product at the end of the, de of the day. So if, if you are getting paid, once the product is done, you can, or, or, or at steps, uh, you are not showing the, or delivering the final product until the end, uh, you know, until the product is already finished. So what happens if you deliver the car and your customer says, mm, this is not what I was thinking of? Then you might have to go back to the drawing board. And then you have to discuss new fees. And then you have to, you know, you're putting yourself in a situation that, you know, the, the, the customer is not a software developer. And uh, you cannot expect the customer to understand how complex all our, our processes are. So with Agile, the main difference is that uh, you get the requirement and you ask you know, to, to build something to take you from place A to place B. So on your first iteration, you're going to build something as fast as you can that can take you from place A to place B with, you know, a skateboard might, might do the trick. And so you deliver the skateboard and you start learning about, okay, uh, how's, how's the road from place A to place B? Is, is it a paved road? Uh, you know, it's a dirt road. Uh, and, and you start learning more about the customer. And the customer starts learning more about you and how you think. Uh, so on the next iteration, you're going to build something better, you know, so, so you, put a, you, you build a bicycle. And you deliver the bicycle that you can do it, okay, more or less in a, in a fast uh, time frame. And, and, and your, your customer can go flow from place A to B faster and you know, and, and he can have uh, gears, so so he can, you know, he he gets more of the idea. And then on on, on the third iteration, you add a, an engine to that bike, and then you have a motorbike. And then on the last iteration, you finally deliver the car. So on on each uh, iteration, you will have a faster iteration, and on each iteration, your customer will get something in order to start working and start doing what they ask you for. So from day one, your customer was able to go from place A to B. So, so that's, that's the concept of the MVP of the minimum viable product. The next concept that we have is, is the backlog. So we get all the requirements and we get all the requirements in a backlog, which is mainly a list of items. And then we estimate and, and we discuss with the client. Okay, you, all, you need all these requirements. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, the, for the first MVP, we're gonna do this item, this item, and this item. And we're gonna put it, put it on sprint number one. Once it's delivered, uh, we're going to do this item, this item, and this item, and we're going to put it in sprint number two. So mainly what you have is you have all your pending items, and you start deliver, de delivering them in sprints. So if something else comes up, you just add it to the backlog. So the, the idea here is that really, your product 
never ends. Because one thing that it's important is that, you know, back in 1990, when I was first doing my first FileMaker uh, uh, solutions, I, I was, you know, uh, once it, it was done, uh, I will you know, put them on diskettes and deliver them on diskettes. So the product was done. Then, you know, we went to CD-ROM and, and it was the same. The product was done. Uh, but now, you know, as the things change over the last years, you know, since, since you know, we have fast internet nearly everywhere in the world, uh, we, we can keep on uh, doing changes and delivering them uh, whenever they, they, they are needed. So the concept of a product, you know, really you know ending uh you know it's it's not black and white anymore it's it's a great area so the you know it's you always have have changes and things that you can keep on adding so uh with the mvp what what it says is that you know i i always consider what i call the health line uh that is, okay, there is a number, uh, uh, an, an, a specific number of sprints that I can do over a certain time. But if I need to work more hours, uh, then it's above my health line. So, so really, I know, you know, I, I try to work from 9 to 5, uh, Monday to Friday. Um, and, you know, I, I used to work. Uh, you know, infinite numbers of hours. Um, but but now I really try to, you know, have my spare time and do all the things that I like to do apart from work. And with the MVP, when, if, if you know, if you have more work and, and you're working more hours than you set up to, then uh, it's it's as easy as you know add someone else to your project, and as as you are delivering small chunks of code, it's easier. Uh, you know, for example, if if you are doing something with FileMaker and WebDirect, um, and you need to deliver more stuff, or uh, it's you know it's easy just to get someone that might help you with PHP or Web or HTML for a specific part of, of the backlog. So, okay, this item uh, will, go, will, will go to someone else and someone else will, will work on it. So, um, I don't know if, if, if you have any doubts up, up to this part, I'm happy to answer questions and then we can move on. I think I think Diego, what you said is the fact that it's smaller chunks. This is what we were talking about earlier about like with the presentations and, and getting people to talk about projects. I think it's easier to deliver in smaller chunks. So, um, and I think that's the idea is if you can then prioritize your work in that way, I think it gives you more scope to to grow. Certainly from a, a project point of view. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 what's interesting is you know. Uh, this this change, because uh, because I heard that many of you are independent developers, and, and you know, the, the 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 problem is that when you are an independent developer, you you have to have a constant income, um, and that it's really difficult, you know, because yeah, you're you're really hitting the nail on the head for me, Diego. Um, you're, you're answering a lot of things that uh, I see all the time, I experience all the time. So I, I you know, I, I think that with with Scrum, uh, and, and nowadays there are tools in, in FileMaker. Many years ago it was more difficult, but, you know, uh, with, uh, you can use a tool like Otto from, from Geist, which allows you to, you know, uh, 
deliver upgrades and you know I I, I didn't try uh, with FindMaker 19 doing uh, you know like bundles and that kind of stuff but I think that FileMaker is going in into this direction right now so so it's easier and easier with, with every new release of FileMaker to do Scrum and I think that I don't know, but but I guess that they even realize because right now FileMaker is on a Scrum based uh, process. So so that's that's the way the, uh, that that's how they they are getting you know more releases over a shorter period of time. If if you remember many years ago, the the, the, the FileMaker life cycle was like eighteen months from version to version. And um, right now they, they said that okay they are they, they want to get like shorter and and the reason is that they went into the waterfall methodology that's okay you do everything and you release it into the scrum methodology that it's okay so so now that I believe that they are getting into scrum uh, they are building their their own tools and they are releasing them. That's that's you know completely unofficial and it's it's something I, I guess that it's it's the way they are working. So that's why we are having these tools right now. So if if I don't know how how we are on time, uh, I have some. If I have like, uh, so you've got about ten minutes left. Okay, so. If oh, no, let me... okay, so one one thing you know that I found really useful it's yeah I I, I, I believe that attitude is, is everything. Um you know, I, I really love the, the happy Mac, Mac icon. I even have a tattoo of it. Uh, and because, you know, the, the happy Mac icon is like, it was an entire philosophy behind that icon. You know, it's that it said that uh, you have to be user friendly. So uh, I work with. A lot of developers over the, the last years and oh, the past decades, um, I realized that there are a lot of develop developers that you know they don't like dealing with customers. And if if you don't like dealing with with human beings, uh, you know then I don't know if 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 you are on the on the right, you know. You, using FileMaker um, and the way FileMaker way is um, and the philosophy you know behind FileMaker, it's I guess it's it's we have to be user friendly. Um, so uh, you know that when I work with with young developers, for example, and they start working on on my team. Uh, when, whenever you know, I notice that they have a bad mood uh, and they are start angry uh, for for a customer or for a, in, in my case right now from someone from inside the company. Because right now I'm you know I have a, a development department that it's and for an in-house development department. Um, it's okay, you know. The, 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 the user and one thing that we have to understand is that whatever tool we build it's crucial for the end user because we can build a tool and we, del we can deliver it and we forget about it but it's the tool that the end user is using every single day so if the end user is, is having a crisis uh, or the end user doesn't understand something, it's our responsibility as developers for that user to understand. 
because it's yeah, and this is something that it's you know it's it happens everywhere in the world it's like oh this this dumb user you know and one thing that i think that made the macintosh so great was was the philosophy that you know the we have to make and build things for the end user and the end user has no responsibility uh, if 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 you build something and it doesn't work it's our responsibility so uh one one thing you know i found during the years instead of saying no i use the yes but so uh this is a real story once i had a, 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 a I, I went to a meeting and I had a, a potential customer that he had this project. It was during the 2000s. And this, uh, this guy at the meeting tells me that, okay, uh, I want to build something like Google, but better. And that was all the speech. So you know, instead of saying, uh, you know, no, it's ridiculous what you're you are wasting my time. I will. I, I went with a yes, but uh, we'll need about twenty five million dollars in order to, just to start. So you know, it, it was a more positive response. Uh, okay, yeah, I can do it, but you know, first give me twenty five million dollars and we'll start uh, working. So. You know that that positive attitude really helps. You know, in, in dealing with the customers, um, it's it's always good to have a, a plan B or C or D or F or up to Z. So, okay, you know, we're gonna make an implementation of a new build of our software. Okay, you know, uh, do a checklist. Uh, okay. We're gonna need a backup, and we're gonna have uh, everything on server A, and we'll also have another server set up. And what will happen if everything crashes? How are we gonna do the rollback? So, you know, things can fail, and failure failure uh, is part of our life as developers. Um, but I think that as long as as you have a plan B or C or D, uh, you might get also a positive response in case of a failure. You know, I, I worked many years for the uh, airline in, for for the uh, airline industry, and when, what I learned working with airlines is that uh, you know, as as long as you are not uh, negligent on, on your work, uh, it is accepted that things might fail. So, uh, so there's really no criminalization of, of the error. You know, a plane might fall and people might die and it's part of the industry. So uh, as long as there's a checklist and that's the reason why they have checklists for everything, um, and so, so if you do a checklist for everything, and, and you really have a lot of plans, and and you have contingency plans, uh, if something fails, well, okay, what you'll have to do is learn from that mistake, uh, write down what happened, have your own documentation, and then you know keep on working. Uh, and it's, uh, I think that it's always important to say to your customers that, okay, you know, we're going to do this. These are the risks. It might fail. And in case of failure, we're going to do A, B, or C. So, you know, I, I think that that's, uh, that's, you know, like, like, like a way, you know, of, of having a, a, a good relationship with your client. And you know, just one one tip. Um, I, I I use uh, Vincenzo tools a lot. Um, one thing that I, I think that it's it's really very useful uh, is to have naming conventions. 
because if, if you are using an MVP and, and you want to work with other developers, uh, the, the, the most clear your, your code is, uh, it will be easier you know, to share. So for example, uh, the, if, if I have modules, let's say, that, let's go to a simple, you know, invoices, clients, orders, etc. And um, I put numbers on it. It's it's way easier, you know, if, if I don't know if I have it open here, but it's, it's way easier, uh, you know, to say, okay, I have a problem with module 233 and, you know, work on that module with not that number that uh, say that okay you know I have a module a, a module a problem with the uh, um, you know script uh, on layout perform enter script uh, lower dash final okay so one thing that I use is I, I number all my modules so I have if I have a script on the Invoices module, it will be 0100 and the layouts will be 0100. So everything is related to that numbering system. Uh, so in that way, it's it's way easier, you know, to, to share your code and to read your own code. And, um, you know, I think that also another thing that it's very important, um, Nowadays, it's very easy to have your own ticketing um, solution. Uh, right now, I'm even using one that's that's free, that's from Spiceworks. Uh, and, and what is really great is that uh, you know I have certain scripts that if if something goes on uh, wrong with the script, it will create a ticket. Uh, if everything goes okay, it will create another ticket. So I really have knowledge of what's going on before the user tells me that is something wrong is going on. Because uh, you know it's 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 way better to to know bef beforehand. Uh, you know, rather than the user getting frustrated and calling you and telling you, okay, you know, uh, this isn't working, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if, if you know, for example, if, if I get at 8 in the morning that some process that ran at night, uh, something went wrong, the first thing I do in the morning is I tell that user, okay, you know, we had some issues with this process. We are working on it. Once, once everything is okay, uh, we'll send you an email. So, so you know, it gives more confidence to the user that you know their system that is crucial for their everyday work is in good hands. So, really, I, I think that I covered mostly. All, all the things that I wanted to share with you. I don't know if you have any doubts. I think that was amazingly useful, Diego. There was uh, a lot of things you said rang really true and some really useful tips in there and uh, some really useful information. I think that's great. I don't know what other people feel. I think that was, I was yeah, well impressed with that. Thank you. Thank you. I like the idea of the ticketing system. The ticketing system is quite neat. It's the fact that if you can get a heads up on the client or, or even whether it's internal or a member of staff that's doing something wrong and you go, all oh, right, the reason why is you're clicking this this script before that script. It says in the instructions you should do it that way. If you can error trap for that, catch that, and then it becomes a training need for the individual client. So you can then feedback before it goes wrong, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, you know, and, and the thing is that, uh, for example, I have, well, I have e e everything that goes on in in the office right right now integrates with the ticketing system. You know, the backups and the grids and you know, like everything. Um, 
I, I, I even check, you know, the, the, consist the consistency of the databases uh, uh, every day when I do the backup and I have a small script that I read the log of the consistency check. And if the consistency check uh, has some issue, I will get a ticket. So, and, and I think that another thing that it's it's awesome uh, is the integration with FileMaker and Sabix. So, if something is going on with the server and uh, your server is a, is about to crash, uh, FileMaker will create a DMP file at least on on Windows. So yeah. if you get and, and if you see on your log folder a DMP file is you know something is about to go very wrong. So if, if Sabix can can create you know an alert for your DMP file. So if you have a DMP file and and you get an alert that says uh, potential crash something like that DMP file created, you know just you have to call your users and tell them, okay, you know, we're gonna shut down everything. Uh, you have to check the logs and start looking at, okay, what what is going on? Usually it's when a script, and, and so if you have systems that are connected with ODBC, with other databases, and something is like, you know, not working very well, uh, that that will be one of the reasons, or or if you have you know uh, an unstored calculation with many 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 dependencies, and some user perform a find into that field, that will create a DMP file, and that's one of the reasons your FileMaker server might crash. So so you get a yeah a heads up that okay something bad is about to go wrong. You know, at least check that all your backups are okay. Restart the server and have a look at it. So I know. we use Avix. We use Avix across our estate as well. And if you're not using it, it's if you've got a reasonable size setup, it doesn't. You can do it even with one server. It doesn't really matter. But um, it gives you a really good insight to what your server's doing, how it's performing, um, how many remote calls you're getting a second, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can even the, the advantage of it is with FileMaker uh, 18 and above now to get the log file out is you have to go to the server or you go onto the admin console and download it. With Zabbix, is reading that login every 10, 15 seconds. So you mm -hmm. can just have a Zabbix window open and you can then see what's going on with your server. So knowledge is key. I think I think that's the key thing you're trying to get to, Diego. Once you've got the knowledge, you can then act on that. And so whether it's with the client, whether it's internally yourself to check the servers. Um, it's certainly worth looking at if you're not if you're not got any monitoring tools on the servers that you host. I'd, I'd urge you to go and get something, um, even if it's something just to dump the file out and put it into a FileMaker database. I've seen people that have built a FileMaker database to read the log file. That's fine. It's better to have that than nothing. So mm -hmm. that's really useful, Diego. Thank you. Um, really good. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much, Diego. We're slightly behind at the moment. Uh, not too much. Uh, Ian, are you are you ready? Right, I'm going to start off um, really, really quickly um, with the presentation I did last time. I'm just going to skip through most of it. Uh, basically, for those who don't know me, I've been using FileMaker since version 3, sort of on, on 18. Um, uh, been doing quite a lot of work on large internal systems, um, as well as our other software architecture stuff. For the last uh, seven years, uh, I've just finished my MBA at Warwick Business School, and my dissertation was on the strategic implications of machine of artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, so, in April, at the worst time in the world, I started my company, and uh, the intent really is that we're going to build an ML, a machine learning based document management product. And so, that's going more slowly than we'd like, but it's heading in the right direction. Um, just quickly go over the capabilities just as a refresher um, that basically we can do regression, we can pr predict continuous values, we can do classification, i.e. based on input values, we can predict labels, um, recognizing and generating sequences and 
learning a strategy are beyond the scope of anything we can do in FileMaker, but regression and classification we can now do. So we've got um, three strands, which is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And we'll primarily be looking at supervised learning today, where we combine training data with an algorithm to produce a model. So supervised learning takes tr our training data with an algorithm and a set of parameters through a training process to produce a trained model. Um, the algorithms at this point are not quite commoditized, but they're for the purposes of what we'll be looking at, you can treat them that way. So the main sort of area of interest is the training data and how we work with that. Core ML is a, it's an Apple standard. It's not the most common standard for machine learning models, but it basically allows applications uh, on Mac OS to take advantage of machine learning models. And it also, fundamentally, they also call their, their, uh, their model framework Core ML. So you may have heard of others such as TensorFlow, uh, scikit-learn. There's a couple of others that are that are more common, and we can convert some of these to Core ML and use them, but that's really quite difficult. Um, okay. So, in the case we've got the Core ML model, and Core ML system uses that with the app. So FileMaker would use Core ML to read a Core ML model and apply it. So I won't go into a lot of detail on this because we covered it last time. But we've got the model in a container field. We use the configure machine learning model script step to load the model. We have our inputs to the model and we apply the machine learning model. So the inputs would be an image or a set of parameters. We use the compute model function and that returns a prediction. And then we again use the configure machine learning model script step to unload the model. And that's basically how it works. So this is what I wanted to talk about here. The When we're operating the, um, the model in production, that's where our FileMaker system is using it. What we're primarily interested here in today is how do we, from the prepare data section, how do we build a model? And how do we test the model? And then how would we go about deploying that? Uh, I won't go too, too much into how we acquire the data. Um, but fundamentally, if you're interested in building your own models, you've probably got internal sources of data that you're interested in. You can use those with other publicly available data sources, purchased data, or alternative data sources. So alternative data sources might be things like satellite images. So if I just hide that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, three different, building three different kinds of models today. So we're going to start off with uh, building an image classifier, where what we'll do is our data set will be of animals, and we'll build a model that can distinguish between cats uh, dogs and pandas. So in this case, we've got um, what we're doing basically here is we're doing supervised learning. And the way we're going to do supervised learning is that we've taken our data set, we've split it up into the three different classifications. So our model will tell us whether we've got a cat a dog or a panda when presented with a photograph of one of those. So to train the model, we basically get a load of photographs of cats. In this case, we've got, uh, I think we've got a thousand. So we've got a thousand photos of cats, a thousand photos of dogs, and a thousand photos of pandas. 
and we're basically going to divide those up into a training, a data set that is used for training, a data set that is used for testing, and then one to validate what we've done built. Uh, and we're going to build the CoreML model using Apple's tools. This only works on Catalina or more recent operating systems. So my main computer running Mojave can't use the version of Xcode that we need to use. So it's Xcode 11.6 or more, any of the more recent versions. So if we launch Xcode, um, under the Xcode menu, we've got a set of developer tools. So if we say open developer tool, there's one called create ML. So if I open that, if I say I want to create a new project, it then gives us um, a number of choices. We've got an image classifier, object detector, we can work with sound, motion. Now most of these will not, we wouldn't be able to work with FileMaker. A text classifier, word tagger. Uh, then we've got those that work with data tables as well. A tabular regression, tabular classifier, and a recommender. So the ones we're going to go through today are an image classifier. That's the first one with the classifying the images of cats, dogs, and pandas. Once we've done that, I'll show you a tabular regression where we can build a model that can predict numbers. So let's say you had the sales history of a company over time. You might be able to build a tabular regression model that would help you with prediction of sales. Alternative, we've got a tabular classifier. And the example we're going to use there is um, a data set that's used quite widely for learning, machine learning, which is for um, classifying irises into one of three different types based on information about the, the, um, the, the irises. So I'll start off by saying choose a template, image classifier, say next. I'll say classify animals. I'm not going to worry about the license information at the moment. Say next. I'll just save that. Sorry, I'm just going to. Um, demo. I've got an earlier version that I may want to show you. So. So that's created our project. What we can do is we can specify the, the inputs. So the data inputs are training data. What do we use for training data? What do we use for validation? And what do we use for testing? And then we've got an output up here where it, when it generates the model, it will put the output there. We've also got a number of things we can do to augment the data. So frequently you'll find that adding noise or blurring images when doing the training will help the recognition. Uh, so if we start by choosing our training data, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose um, Animal 100, the train. So if I just select the folder that contains, so you can see, I'll just say select that, and you can see it now knows we've got 300 items in the folder. And that folder is here. So if I say train, we've got 100 dogs, 100 cats, and 100 pandas. Uh, the reason that I've gone with 100 instead of 1,000 is that when I ran this earlier with 1,000, it took about uh, 12 minutes to do the training. 
which uh, for the purposes of a demo like this would make for a very, very boring and even more boring presentation than um, the one you're getting. So um, right, so that's our training. For parameters, I'm going to say a maximum iterations of 25. The reason I'm saying that is that earlier on when I didn't specify that, it I found it was doing um, a vast number of iterations, taking a very long time. Now, the distinction between validation data and testing data is that validation data is used in the process of training to see how it's going. And it can automatically apply that, or we can, again, select files. So if I select my validate folder, in each case, the folders within it need to be the same. So it needs to have the same structure as the training data. And it's using that folder structure to determine what the labels are. So if I select that, and then I'll do the same thing with test data. Um, I'm not going to do any of the augmentation with adding noise uh, or blurring. Yeah, are, the, are the images in those folders the same in each of those three folders? No, they're not. Sorry, thank you. That's a, that's a very important point. They have to be different. Um, otherwise, you won't get. So the, the training data has to be different from the test data or the validation data. Otherwise, you won't get a correct uh, measure of how accurate it is. Um, so, so when you get a set of data and you're doing it this way, you basically need to split it up. Um, in the case of most other systems for doing this, so scikit-learn, for example, you basically would just pick the set of data and then it got, it's got tools within it to separate into training and test data. And that's probably better than doing it manually. Um, but for the purposes of this, we have to do this manually unfortunately, which I've got to say is a little bit of a pain getting the same number of um So I'll come back to the, the things about preparing the training data uh, later. So if I just start that training, you will now see this is going to take about a couple of minutes. And as you can see, my screen is getting a bit um, slow now. It's it takes a fair bit of computing horsepower to to do this. So actually my computer is really, really I um I would have preferred it preferred if I could do this on my main workstation because it's got uh it's got a fair chunk more memory than this. So that would be better. But fundamentally the the folder structure we're using defines the three classes that it's going to do the classification into. And um, so you're using 100 images, but you said you prefer to use 1,000. Is, is 1,000 about normal? Um, it, it really varies, actually. Some of the larger models that you'll see, um, uh, some of the ones, for example, that are downloadable from Apple, you'll find that those basically were built with maybe millions of images. Mm -hmm. And that to build a model like that, you're looking at several days of compute time on, um, on something fairly heavy duty at Google or Amazon. Yeah. So given the nature of the processing, basically it's something that lends itself to GPUs. If it's running on a CPU, it's quite slow by comparison to if it can get loaded, offloaded to a GPU. Um, that's considerably better. Uh, and to be honest, what I normally do is I don't do this on the computer I'm working on. I I would just basically set something running on my on my Mac Mini server, and then it just takes however long it takes. 
okay, um, rather than um, rather than taking forever. Yeah, I I tried a couple of I tried with a thousand that was quite lengthy, and I tried two hundred and that was also fairly lengthy. So um, hopefully um, we're not too far off. <laughs> Sorry about this. Ian, if you're doing if you're doing this if you're doing this a lot, I suppose having even a a, a modern Mac Mini with an external GPU attached, so you can buy a Thunderbolt external GPU. Yeah, uh, if you if you if you're, if you're you can doing, offload. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you're doing that, um, then you're into a big configuration sort of issue that you would need to configure the software to use a GPU, which in a lot of cases yeah. would require. Com- building something from scratch. Uh, okay. A lot of the model development, um, people do, tend to do in the cloud. Um, mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, you can do a surprising amount in the cloud for for free. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But it's... Um, now, this is something that I, I don't quite understand. Um, I don't understand why it's saying that it's processed 50 of 25 iterations. Um, <laughs> that's I. I it's built I, by Microsoft, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all Apple. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, to be honest, the advantage of using these tools is that it builds a core ML, L metal core ML model sort of out of the box. So there's no conversion required. So for example, if I built a model with TensorFlow and then wanted to convert it to core ML, I need to worry about a number of different things. So for example, when my model was looking at colors, did it refer to them as RGB, you know, with zero to two five five, or did it, um, or did it scale things? Uh, often you'll find things will be scaled between ze- a value of zero and one um, for the purposes of, of of simplification of training. So that's the kind of thing that needs to be worried about. And if you built the model, then you probably know that, that kind of stuff. If you didn't build a model, then you're really going to be um, guessing. This should be done fairly soon, I think. Um, Sorry, the other examples I'm going to show are take about 20 seconds to run. Uh, the images, it's got to do a lot of work. And So, um, Ian, if I was using something like this at work, so some of the stuff we have, we try to isolate what it is. Um, uh, so is it a pop vinyl? Is it a book? Is it a, a graphic yeah. novel? Purely from a point of our load team that loads, we, we load what, probably 10,000 products on our website. Yeah. Um, probably every every quarter. So I could possibly use something like this that, and we've got enough back catalogue of product with pictures already coded. So could I inject that into say I already know these three hundred images are pop vinyls? Yeah, I could preload that and say use these with the tag know they're pop vinyls done. Therefore, it then has already learned because it's similar to what you're doing with your folders, isn't it? You're saying I've already put. <sighs> all of those in a folder and just get it to go learn it. And then, then when the next one comes along, it goes, oh, I've got 300 that match. That's a pop final. Uh, absolutely. And many of the other, um, what you find is that many other, um, for training with other systems like scikit-learn or TensorFlow, you'll find that people wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't stick them into folders because sticking them into folders right. is just, it's a pain to do. So what they would have is perhaps an index where you've got right. the you have the image and then something with the um either an index file or you could actually do it within the naming and then you just basically would code it to distinguish based on that the advantage we've got is as already coded and it's in filemaker so i can export the image and the index straight out if i needed to from yeah, a starting yeah. point of view i've already yes. got that so i've got a quarter of a million images sitting there already coded so, yeah, it, it's it's the kind of thing to be honest that starting off with like a smallish experiment is probably better than starting off trying to process a quarter of a million. 
Um, no, I agree. I wouldn't, I wouldn't chuck all of them in. <laughs> I think <laughs> but, but I no. think it as you're doing, I could grab a hundred pop vinyls, a hundred books, a hundred toys, and then just see whether that, because the biggest thing we have on the site is ca- the, the load team have to categorize stuff. And if I can get a machine to suggest what it is up front, brilliant. It just saves the job. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, one of the things there is that um, if you could, if you could do that, it's not going to be a hundred percent accurate. But you could get something that basically you could have it, that the process people would need to do would be one of just checking and validating rather than yeah, yep, absolutely. Which, is, which while it's tedious, is probably less tedious. It's less tedious than going from a value list which we've got in the database where they pick the wrong one. <laughs> so at least they oh, can yeah. have a recommendation and it goes is this correct <laughs> and they just go yes or no and if it's no then they go to the value list and still pick the wrong one so that's fine <laughs> we're no yeah, worse yeah. off no certainly certainly something like that could uh, could certainly be done one one of the to be honest labeling data is one of the dirty secrets about machine learning is that basically because supervised learning needs vast quantities of labeled data what a lot of companies are doing is outsourcing to India where people have basically set up sweatshops where where basically people sit in these warehouses of computers and label data all day um, and it's from from an ethics perspective with with machine learning and AI it's something that people um, you know probably need to think about <laughs> but don't necessarily yeah. um Okay. Oh, I just grabbed the wrong mouse because I've got two computers here. Okay, so that's finally done. So it's saying precision is about 98, 99%. Um, if we look at, if we click on the output, the model, what we can actually do now is we can we can look at other images that were not. So where did I put them? Ah, there we are. I've got some other images that I just had. I can drag those in here. And so you can see, okay, it's 100% sure that's a panda. 100% sure that's a dog. 100% sure it's a cat. And cat and dog, it's given us 51% confidence. But it's a dog and 49% cat. So again, this, this comes back to something I spoke about last time, and that is about the context that models are being applied. That they're they really only work within the context that you're um, you're you're working on. So, and the so from my point of view with that, Ian, based on the math side of that is because I know there's two subjects in there, a 50 and 51 percent is a 99 or 100 percent match. Yeah. Yeah. But that's because the dog's bigger. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So yes. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, you're right. Dogs, about context yeah, about what you're putting in. So, but okay. now the, the, the interesting thing that I, and I wanted to show you is. I think this is the one I did earlier. That if I do the same thing, wow! That was a, so, oh, wow. and if I do the two hundred of each, which is a larger set, a larger training set, it for whatever reason. So this is one of the, again, this is one of the key things that I, I sort of said in our, in our last talk, and that is that if you, if you think about it, that you'd never be able to write a set of if-else or case statements that could take a picture like this and break it, tell you whether it's a dog or a cat. So really what we've done is we've, we've basically shown the software a load of examples, and it is basically minimize, what it's done is it's basically applied mathematical models to it and try to minimize the errors but the fact is that it's not deterministic it's probabilistic so 
Um, this this one where it says fifty one percent makes the most sense to me. Um, but and I'm not sure why it's saying hundred percent on this one and eighty four on that one. It's um, it might be possible to find out, but I suspect it would be very very difficult. Um, so now at this point, what we can do is so there's our output, there's our model. We just basically drag that and drop that and so where did I drop where did I drop that? Ah, uh, there we are. So that's our animal classifier model. It's a model document. If I double click on that, oh, sorry, I've got the wrong thing here. Project. Ah. If you double click on the model itself, Xcode will tell you information about the parameters of the model, the inputs and the outputs. Now, with FileMaker, in the case of images, that doesn't really matter because the input, it's the parameter name is always going to be image. But with different types of uh, models, there are potentially different parameter names that you need to know for the model to work. So I built a, I built a web page that would tell you this, but to be honest, what they built in Xcode, it gives a nicer presentation than the, than the one I did. Um, so, um, are there any questions to this point about the um, the image classifiers? Yeah, is it is it um, is it possible to find something that uh, to, to have a model that will create the number of uh, test the number of objects in the image to resolve your say your cat and dog problem? Um, not through this method. Okay. Um, it, you would use some, it, it certainly is technically possible, and um, you would use um, different systems like probably OpenCV, which is um, a computer vision product project. What that could do is that basically will be allow you to separate out things of interest in the model. And then from there you could, um, so OpenCV is frequently used. So, so things like um, the automatic license plate reading systems are almost certainly going to be OpenCV models um, that, that aren't actually doing deep learning, um, but they're using this, this system for, machine, for, for that. It can also do quite a lot of work, say on face detection, detection of facial features, that kind of thing. It's similar to the Amazon model, isn't it? That Amazon's got one where you could actually upload a photo and it tells you how many people are in the shot, how many people got yep. their eyes open, how many people got smiling and stuff like that. That's just basically smart Im image recognition. So you could I apply technically that mapping to that image first and say there are two subjects. Correct. Get the uh, result uh, and then apply that to the result of the model. Yeah. So. And, and in fact, what you what you tend to do is what what works more effectively than than applying a single model to, to images, but applying sort of a series of models to break it down and get different attributes of different parts of it. So for example, a house pricing model would be quite difficult to program to take photographs of a, a house and then predict the price. However, if you took it and you basically said, this house is made of wood, this house is made of brick, um, what a separate model, what kind of condition does it look to be in? another model, how big is it, get the results from those and then feed those into a further model, you'll get much better results than you would by having a single model to try to do the whole thing in one. Um, and you could do it with a lot less training data as well. Ian, how, how are you doing on time? Because we're uh, technically yes. towards the end. But okay, uh, what, how much time? If, if John's uh, happy to run on and uh, to do it a bit later and everyone else is... Happy okay. to hang on a bit. We could probably run on a bit. Okay. What? Uh, how long have I got? A minute left. Yeah, you certainly got a minute left. <laughs> yeah, we don't okay. have to be too accurate. <laughs> if 
Um, I'll tell you what, if John is okay, can I run over by two or three minutes and I'll show you um, doing um, the another um, type, a classification of tabular data? Yeah, that would be good. interesting. You go. Okay, cool. So I'll say new project. In this case, I'm going to say tabular classifier. Same thing again, basically rename it. Create that, I'll just replace the existing one I've got. Um, okay, I select my training data, select the files. Go into my data sets, I'm going to use the Iris data set. Basically what I've got here is a CSV file. It says training data is not ready. I need to choose, I'll just open my CSV file to show you what's in it. So you've got the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and then what class of iris is it based on those four pieces of data. So I choose my target. My target is I want to know what class it is. I'll select my features. You can see the type. I won't get a whole lot into data types right now because that gets messy, but I'll select that. We can, I'll just let it choose the algorithm automatically, but we can also, we can choose which kind of algorithm. I won't bother about testing data and I'll just say train. There we are, that is done. That's built a model and if I now Uh, if I do my test irises, you can see that it's now in my data that it's 80, in this case, it's 81% confidence of the type. It is based on the data here. And that in the case, it's um, the test data, to be honest, is just numbers I made up. So they may make no sense in the, the context of what actually is a valid number. So that gives you a really, really quick idea of how you can build a classifier for different types of... Um, now, if we go back here, what we would do is if we wanted to try different types, we would say add, basically we choose our data again. We can maybe say we want to try a random forest. Again, we choose our target, select our features, And if I train that, that's looking a bit less confident and I'll just drag that on. And then so it's 80% confident. 70. So so basically using the different parameters, we can change the we end up with models that are at different degrees of confidence. So um anyway. I really, really want to see John's presentation because Node Red sounds really, really cool. So I will, um, I will sort of finish up for now, and I'll, but I'll be hanging around after. So if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy okay, to yeah, discuss okay. it later. We'll, we'll take questions to the uh, to the virtual bar afterwards. So if um, I um, do, I need to do anything to stop presenting or just hit the stop um, present button. It's in the top of your screen. Yeah. Right in the middle of your screen, I can see it. Ah, oh, there. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. Okay. Done. Cool. Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much for your time, guys. That was that was really interesting. Thank you very much. Really it was good. Fascinating. Really liked it. Really, uh, I'm brave to do it live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or well, stupid. One of them. I don't know which one. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, John, okay. All good. Okay. We can see. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, a quick bit of PowerPoint to start with because then that can be uploaded. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, Node-RED, and there's going to be a lot of live coding in this as well, but then Ian's managed to pull it off. So I have a question for you, which is, what kind of toys you played with as a child? Uh, the reason I ask is because I'm in the middle of clearing my warehouse, 
uh, and I discovered the box that came from my mother's house of some of my childhood toys. This, for those who are too young to know, is Meccano. Oh, Um, Meccano's brilliant. A child of the 50s and early 60s will have played with this. Um, Now connect. You take take (laughs) pre-assembled parts, uh, the green bits, the plates, uh, screw them together with nuts and bolts to make amazing things. Okay. What we're going to look at today is the 2020 equivalent of the same thing. Uh, the kind of things that my grandchildren will be playing with because it's now all electronic. Uh, so I'll read this really quickly. Node Red, it's a it's a programming tool which can wire together both devices, APIs, or services in interesting ways. That was the point about Meccano. <clears throat> you start with a box of pieces and then said, what can I make? Same kind of thing with Lego. Using a browser uh, in as an editor, it's really easy to just kind of create wires between them, which we'll show you. And then you deploy what you've created to a runtime uh, in one click. It was started in 2013 as an IBM side product uh, project, but it is now open sourced. Um, so the runtime engine that is behind it all is node.js. So everything that you're going to see today is basically some kind of graphic interface to some JavaScript. And it was designed to run on edge computing, tiny little devices, uh, whether they're in your office or on the kind of literal edge of the world, like Raspberry Pis, can run this stuff. And in terms of acceptance, they currently have a large number of modules in their package repository. So the flows that we're going to see um, are all stored using JSON. What that means is you can kind of export it to the clipboard, share it, save it. There's a really easy learning curve with being able to copy and paste stuff that you find off the internet. Just drop it in and see if it works. There are, there's a fantastic get, get started. So nodered.org is where you go to find the official pages, some fantastic documentation there. Um, we're also going to look at what is can be a free service, so you don't even know, need to go and find your Raspberry Pi uh, called Fred. That's just where to find it, so you can find it later. Um, if you run a Raspberry Pi, all you have to do, which is what I did several months ago, just follow the instructions, and it works. Bit of command line, download this, run this, package this, off you go. This is a documentation. There's both tem- templates tutorials, and a cookbook, how to do a whole variety of tasks. Uh, so that's what you see inside No Red. And this is, if you get to fred.sensetechnic.com, this is what you can see. On the right-hand side, most important, there is a free tier. Uh, free tier works by insisting that you log back in every 24 hours, otherwise your stuff goes dead. So it's not for production, but it's a proper way to test. And this is what a node red screen will look like. Down the left-hand side are a series of nodes, workspace in the middle, and on the right, uh, an information pane, and there's a pop-out. So what you see is something like this. It's a widget with a connector hole on the left or the right, or on both sides. And so you drag that into the middle, connect them from those dots, to make something. The right-hand side, which we will look at in a bit of detail, there's uh, information. So if you click on a node, you can see some information. But in some cases, if you double-click the node, an extra pane drops out, which is the configuration pane. And we're going to make a lot of use of that today. So something to understand before we go into it is the nodes pass a JSON message object with a payload along the chain. So message.payload is what's being passed backwards and forwards down the chain. Uh, if you get to a point where, it's, where there's a null, a null is ignored uh, later on. So um, first task is that at least one of you needs to go onto Twitter right now and tweet something which has either FileMaker or Claris 
in the tweet, okay? And then we're gonna to go to the first of those URLs because um, Node-RED is already running in the background collecting something and we're gonna go straight there and look at that, which I'm going to be doing in this browser window here. So here's a dashboard. We're gonna start with an end, uh, not quite the FileMaker end. Here's a dashboard, Node-RED, is generating a random number every five seconds, which is what's driving the graph at the top and driving the chart underneath. And uh, the node red uh, flow that's running this is also looking for tweets that have Claris or FileMaker in them and will pop them to the top. So we'll come back and look at that in a moment and see if anybody's, let's go on. Somebody's just put, it's actually coming at the bottom for reasons which are, okay. It's at the bottom. There's a there's a there's there's at least one tweet. We'll come back and look at uh, how that's changed later. So here we are in Fred. Let me just set this up. Um, so really, really simple, okay. A genuinely, you can get to here, you can all do this. Um, so we're gonna start with just some of the most common nodes and we're gonna do this live. So we're gonna drag onto the layout an inject node and we're gonna drag on a debug node. And then all we have to do is select from there and we get a nice little wire. As soon as it hovers over something, we're gonna join those together. Up in the top right, you'll now see that the, de the deploy button has gone red because at the moment that hasn't yet been pushed uh, to the node uh, runtime. It's really quick and simple. There you go, it's done. So on the right hand side, we're watching the debug uh, area. And as you can see, somebody has just put a tweet in uh, which references us. We'll just quickly go back and look at that dashboard. There we go, the tweet has turned up. Somebody else has put a tweet in. So it, that's all happening. We'll show you how the flow is working. Node is just looking uh, for at Twitter for tweets in the background. But uh, we're going to start with we can manually trigger uh, something. So we've got something which is a trigger, and we've got an output. And because this little green button here is green, not white, we're going to see the uh, the result in the right-hand side in the debug. So if I click the timestamp, there we go. That's a Unix timestamp that it's just triggered manually. And if I press it again, we're gonna see it again, but with a different number, okay? So we can trigger a flow to happen and we can read the output uh, of the flow. Basically, that's as simple as it is. By default, when you drag on the inject, it uh, creates a timestamp. If you double click the timestamp, you now get a, a property card saying, okay, what can you do? Instead of a timestamp, tell you what, I'd like it to be a Boolean of true. Click done, click deploy, click the button. What do you think you're gonna to expect to see on the right? That's correct, a Boolean of true. Um, obviously, if I change this to, uh, let me change it to a number, one, two, three, four, five. Click done, okay. Press the button and I'm gonna get a message. The node has undeployed changes because I didn't go up here and click the button, click the button, it's gone away. There we go. We now got one, two, three, four, five. That is the simplest hello world example that you can find. You, you can get up and running in node in that quick once you've got an account on Fred. Uh, if I double click on this particular one, I'm gonna put uh, the word result in there so I can name the nodes. So instead of it showing what its default was, I can name it something that makes sense uh, to me. But because I made a change, I would need to de deploy that again. Uh, and I'm just gonna clear the debug at the side. So if I uh, just uh, marquee random, select them, go up to the hamburger menu and export, it's there, if I copy that to the clipboard, I just go into Sublime, create a new thing, press paste. There it is, it's just some JavaScript, okay? 
So if I delete those, deploy, uh, I'm sorry, deploy, go back into Sublime, put all of that back on the clipboard, go here, click import, paste from the clipboard, click import, there's, there's the two objects that I just exported and imported before. Are you all going to say, that's ridiculously easy, John? Is that all that it, it can do? No, of course it's not. Um, so I've got, I've got a few bits that I pre-built um, just to kind of show so we could get quickly through some things. Uh, copy and paste that. So um, you can, uh, as you as I've done here, I'm looking at two different outputs that I might want to see. Um, obviously, this uh, you can lay it out in whatever way it makes sense for you. You have lots of fun, kind of making it look all very lovely. Uh, let's click deploy. Um, so instead of this one being something that I'm manually clicking, the input here um, is from a URL. And the end point, which I'll we'll just show you in a second, uh, ends with FM bug. So as soon as something hits that URL, then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to set I've got two choices. I can set either the message or a flow variable, which just lasts in this flow, or a global variable. So I'm going to set something called flow.this to be a timestamp. Uh, now I've got a function here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract um, 150,000 from it. Oh, no, let me, let me undo that because that shows we get a negative number. So, uh, so I'm gonna create a Unix timestamp. I'm gonna take a very large number off it. And then this, this one here says, and in this, uh, I'm going really quickly through this. So in here, I'm setting, so this is just JavaScript. I say just JavaScript. So I'm setting a variable. Uh, I had, something called flow.this. Flow.this was the timestamp that I set. So I'm gonna turn that into a number, take 621 billion off it, and then I'm gonna set a variable of it to be that. And then I'm gonna put that to the message.payload. And the reason is because these nodes uh, are set to read message.payload. They're currently off. So I'm gonna turn this on. So what I'll just quickly do is trigger, drag something on to trigger this manually, initially. Uh, deploy. Uh, trigger it, and I'm getting two responses. One is a timestamp, which is coming from this node. And the other is a no response object, because on the end of the chain, um, if we're doing it from a URL, I need to send a status uh, a status uh, back, and there's no object to set it to set it to. So, uh, API.fmbug is going to give me some kind of answer. So, if I just go to here and change the last part of there to fmbug, it's going to give me an answer. What's the answer? Minus sixty something or other, which looks suspiciously like this answer here, which says what I really want to see is uh, what's the result of the maths. There we go, minus 60 something or other. So I'm viewing it locally here, but if I if I read it um, from, uh, by, by trigger it from, from the URL, so the first part is based on it being on Fred, but the last part I've said, make it FM bug and that's just gonna give me the answer back, okay? So I can trigger things manually, I can hit a web service. This is in fact uh, a microservice for those who 
uh, are confused by other people about what that really means. It's just hit a URL, get an answer back. Uh, obviously can't see you or hear you. Hopefully we're all following uh, right now. Let's just go to here. Let's see the chat we're following. Yeah, thank you. I am speaking fast because there's a lot there's a lot to kind of demo because to get to the end, I don't just want to go, oh, here's the thing working at the end. Um, without a little bit of, as you know, I love people to learn things uh, in my presentations or be inspired. Well, with apologies to those who are, are watching in a different time zone, I think probably most people here are happy to run <laughs> off a bit. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no I, I happily kind of do a bit more demo stuff afterwards because I know, you know, uh, not trying to hog the show. So here what I've got is I've got a flow which I can trigger. Um, and I've got a function that I've written uh, which is going to create a random number. So in JavaScript, there is a math.random brackets. So I'm going to create a random number times 456, but I'm also going to round that number. So that will just get me pack the integer part. And then same thing again, I'm going to set a variable called it on the flow. Uh, and then all I'm going to do is set the payload to that it that I just created. That's on, so I'm going to see the answer. So hit that, and this time I'm not going to get the result of this timestamp. I'm going to get this function in the middle does something else. So here we go, a random number of 417, a random number of 294. The end point is now forward slash RND. So if I just turn this to RND and hit it, we get a random number, 179, 29, 217, 417, 425. If I come back in here, because I was still monitoring it, you can see the answers that I gave out. If I clear this temporarily and turn that off, and deploy, then go back here and just refresh the web page. It's generating a load of random numbers, but when I come back into my node red, uh, there's nothing for me to see because I wasn't monitoring or debugging it. Okay. Uh, let's let's kill that and jump to here. So here's an interesting one. Um, it's a it's a flow that I created, but um, the node it was using isn't there anymore, so it can't it doesn't know what to do. So let me show you. I'm going to just delete that for a second. Show you how easy this is to add something else down here on the left. Add or remove nodes. And in fact, um, if I just search for weather. I know it's this node. If I select that, this is going to effectively import this, this set of nodes into this uh, into this project. I do need to restart the instance. Uh, click the button. A bit of fancy trickery. You know, this is just like typing uh, node dash red restart on your Raspberry Pi because um, I'm using Fred to demo it. Uh, stay on there, and let's just reconnect. There. So let's get back to there. Let's delete that. What I had before is still on the clipboard. Import it, and now that node is now. If I look at the bottom of the list, it's imported two nodes for open uh, for open weather map uh, open weather map is a service which talks to uh, to a weather service if i double click it i now get a different kind of configuration page this requires an api key so i'm just going to quickly it's in this document to save me there we go Uh, copy the API key. 
into there. And I'm going to just look at the weather in Leeds, okay? So I've set up my API key. I want to look at the weather in Leeds. And I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to go quickly back and look at uh, deploy. And here we go. Here's a, don't worry about this for the moment. Here's a JSON object of the weather in Leeds right now. It's currently wet in Leeds. So I can phone my son up after this is over and go, oh, see, it's raining where you are. Um, but that gives me some other information like uh, temperature in degrees C and Kelvin. Um, sunset and sunrise, okay? Um, so let me just talk you through what's, what I'm doing here. So I'm taking the output from the weather map. Let me just turn that off, deploy. So I'm literally in this node at the bottom here, I'm just getting back the JSON that I'm getting from the service. So this is like, a, for those who are gonna ask the question later, it's a do-it-yourself Claris Connect. Okay, where you're in control of everything, but you have to build everything. Nothing's done for you. So what I'm getting back from the service is an object, message.payload.weather, message.payload.sunrise, message.payload.clouds. Okay, I'm just going to turn that off. In the top line, I've created a function that says, okay, find me the message.payload.sunset um, because it's uh, milliseconds, if I time, uh, if it's it's in seconds because it's UTC. If I times it by a thousand, bit of JavaScript, a new date with that number, and I'm going to set the message dot payload to be that date as a string. So if I turn this on and deploy, what I'm now getting back in my I'll just in the debug is the answer to. What time does the sunset? Obviously, it's in GMT. So this sunset number here is uh, today, 18.14.2. If I, in fact, click on the number, you'll see that it does also say it cycles through between uh, the raw number and it knows what the data is. So that's giving me the same answer, but I did it as a calculation. Um, what I've created, uh, in the middle here is a function uh, which says, first of all, uh, call the message.post whatever the detail of the weather is. So here, light intensity drizzle. I'm going to generate the date for the sunset. And then I'm going to say, if the payload.weather is clouds, then make the payload cloudy today. Here's the sunset. Otherwise, if the payload weather is fog, Foggy today, take care, and at the end, return null if it's not one of those. And what it's doing is looking at that, and if it's one of those two things, it will send me an email uh, with whatever text string that I just created there, clouds or fog. But it's also, as you know, I like to use Prowl for notification. So I'm just going to really, uh, well, it's been sending me emails all day telling me that at home uh, it's cloudy. Uh, if I go into here and change the uh, change it to mm, Tamworth, which is nearest to me, click done, click, de click done, click deploy. Uh, the weather, I need to turn that on, give me a sec. Um, stayed at Leeds, John. Did it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me just. Uh... Oh, it's because I clicked the buttons in the right uh, in the wrong order. Click done there, then click deploy. Okay. And at the bottom, there's. It's now. Oh, look! It's clouds in Tamworth. If I look out of my window, it probably is clouds. Um. This node now says that sendings failed. Okay, so because it was clouds, it says, oh, you're now supposed to do something. There's not a null after it. If I open this up, the reason is because I copied and pasted it. And although I've told it what the server is, what I haven't told it is uh, 
what the password is. So if I now click done, deploy that. Uh, let's change it to, I don't know. Where Joel might be at the moment. Click done, click deploy. And indeed there. There we go. Apparently you've got clouds as well. Um, if I go and look at my email, uh, click, click refresh. There we go. In the last few minutes, it sent me a message saying it's cloudy today, but this is what time the sun sets. Okay. It is um, indeed cloudy. <laughs> I would, I would hope it might be. Okay. Um. So. That's like from zero to, oh, we're doing lots of stuff really, really, really quickly, okay? Uh, let's go to here. This um, turquoise set of things uh, is the file maker set of nodes, which we can now add. So I'm gonna really quickly demo that. So we have product info, and I'm just gonna um, do an inject and a debug and join them together. Okay, the product info is something that requires configuring. So on the top in the middle, there's a little red triangle. So that means I do need to double click into here. And uh, here I've got the option to add a new client or which is a server, or we'll just use one that I already set up before click on that, um, here's the server name, here's the file that I'm talking to, here's the username and password, which of course, uh, in most cases, have, has to have the correct permissions set. So if I click go, um, here we go, there's the product info for a server, which to be fair is my um, uh, test server. So let me look at uh, layouts, okay? Let me drag layouts on. Uh, so let me just do this, show you how this works. So if I've got these two things joined and I drag a node over the middle, the line turns into a dotted line and it'll now join itself automatically. So that's just a quick trick. Uh, that's that, that's that. So this is gonna get the layouts uh, we'll see if it does anyway. So let me go to there. Right, deploy. And I'm not getting an answer back. Oh yes, I am. What I'm getting back is an array of objects, which are the layouts in this file. Although to be fair, I didn't necessarily, uh, so it's in this database, so that that's in the configuration. So I told it what the server was, what the database was, uh, done, deploy. So I'm just, I'm getting back, what are the database layouts? Um, if I just really drag this in as well, Join that, layout info. If I double click this configuration, it's the same client, but now I need to know what the layout is and just temporarily, I'm gonna do this because we know that's gonna work for the purpose of demo. Click deploy. Now it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't matter that there's two nodes going to the one debug output, what we're gonna see is uh, two answers on the right hand side from each of the each of the questions we've asked. There we go, oh, the layout is missing. So something about what I've done there. Might not be in speech marks. Click go, there we go. So there's the array of layouts and this is the fields data, there are five, uh, six objects on the layout. There's a field called
called doc container. There's a field called the text. There's a field called the num. Uh, so, and if I was, if I look at FileMaker, uh, it's looking at this file here, and there is indeed a doc container, the text, the num ID, and grid on there. So. These are nodes which we can then use to do anything that you can do in the FileMaker data API. Okay, so I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to have to switch. So, mm, quick caveat: um, the version of the node, the FileMaker nodes that uh, you can get to from Fred because it uses its version of a library is slightly out of date. So this is my Raspberry Pi. Which is sitting in my office running some things. And here's a really interesting example where I'm taking, I'm going to trigger something. I want to know the status of one of the servers and the product info. But this product info is for two completely different servers. Then what I'm going to do is join the answers together as an array. And then we're going to show it. I'm going to turn that off because that doesn't work and just inject. So what I've got here is an array of three objects, one of which is um, some status, one of which is uh, about a server, and the other is about a different server. As you can see, those are different servers. So because the configuration is held uh, for this server is held in here. So that's how that talks to that server with a username and a password. If I double click this node, its configuration is held here. So I can do two things at the same time on two completely different servers, okay? So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you this, then we can stop and I can go, I can back up as much as anyone likes kind of after. Um, last time, so, so how, however many months ago it was, I talked about um, logging in FileMaker, and I set myself a theoretical challenge. And the question was, in the case that I wanted to log um, something that was really important for the client to have in their version of log, but also for me in my separate version of the log file, is it possible to create two identical FileMaker records simultaneously, not sequentially, but simultaneously. Uh, and this flow here does exactly that. Um, it was a learning exercise. What it does is it runs a flow, and then these two nodes here, uh, this one on the left, I'll zoom in, sorry, rather than zooming out, uh, jumps to a second flow, and at the end of the second flow, it jumps back in. So that flow says, uh, here we go, there's an in point, there's an out point. And uh, what I want to do at the end is combine the two answers. So if you use the data API a lot, you know that when you create a record, what you get back is the record ID and its modification count. So I am just going to manually trigger this temporarily. And what I've got back is, uh, and don't worry about the stuff at the top, I've got an object with two objects. In one file, it's created record 88, and the other file, it's created record 377. Uh, if I go to, just need to copy that. into web browser forward slash create. So I also have, let's see, do that. In here, I've also got uh, an HTTP endpoint. So if I do a get on the URL slash create, it will run this flow. So that's what this is doing, okay? It's just hitting a URL, so it's an insert from URL to here with create, and the answer I'm getting back is, exactly what I had before. Sorry, shouldn't have gone backwards. It's scrolling with the mouse. So I've got, uh, in one file, I've got a record ID of 90, 
And in the other file, I've got a record ID of 379. Click it again, that goes to 91 and 380. And if I just go into FileMaker, these are the two files that it's hitting. So we'll just do this so we can see it side by side. On the left, there are a number of records. And the last one is currently 380. On the file on the right, the last record is 91, which matches those two numbers there. So if I just uh, move that down to the bottom, you'll be able to see the record count going up again, simultaneously. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, that is properly what we call scratching the surface of what Node Red um, can do. Uh, like I say, happy to kind of sit and talk about stuff later if people are really interested to kind of walk through a little bit of a demo. Um, I think it's a very, very powerful uh, and interesting tool that could open a lot of doors um, for some things that we could do. Once you've created that, I showed with the Twitter thing, I didn't touch it, it's just running in the background. It's literally just running in the background. So if you wanted to create your own dashboard that said, how many users have I got logged onto this file right now? You could potentially do that if you want to run processes on a kind of timed or scripted basis. Uh, I'll stop because otherwise I'll just carry on. Awesome, John. So cool. Really, I, really cool. Absolutely amazing, John. <laughs> uh, you, you said about the Twitter thing. We could then track uh, hashtags that we were doing for a promo that we, we're sending out. So you can literally set that up and it'll levelize dashboard saying, right, these are how many things you've, yep. you've been hashtag commented on. Um, and I noticed with that thing you're doing with the records, you were passing the UIDs. You had identical UUIDs across the files, which is really cool. Uh, yes. So I, I, you know, one of the things I can show you later. So there's a node that will create a unit UID that you can put in the flow. Um, I also worked out how to do it by hand as JavaScript. So I've, I've got both functions, so I can create it myself. So basically, if you don't know how to do something, you can go and find do a Google search on JavaScript, how do I do this? Copy and paste that bit of code into a JavaScript function in Node. That will do the calculation for you. Or in some cases, there is already somebody's written a Node that will just do that. What Louis has so it's Louis de la Parra has written those FileMaker Nodes. He's just created wrappers for all of the functions um, that the data API gives us. But with the added advantage that once you've set it up in Node Red with the username and the password, those username and passwords are never in FileMaker ever again. As in, nobody can see them. They're in, hidden away in your Node Red, and they just stay active. It doesn't matter when you hit it. You don't have to log on, do something, then log off. The Node Red will just handle that for you, and can and will effectively queue multiple simultaneous requests and it fixes something which I'll, is broken in Pharmaca server which I can tell you later in secret if you really want surely nothing's broken in Pharmaca server I can't <laughs> believe that <laughs> what a naughty boy you are anyway <laughs> uh, there you go. I, do, I was like I appreciate 10,000 feet proper you know eagle's eye view but it works and it works from the very simplest just drag two things on, wire them together, you get an answer, up to something really much more complex. Actually, John, the, the, you kind of answered the question I had, sort of who who wrote the FileMaker? Um, sorry, I'm not sure what the term is for them. But uh, the... Um, um, well, I, who... who um, so does he work at, Does he work for Claris or... Louis does now work familiar, for Claris. But, um, he worked for Seed Code for a bit, um, and he worked on his own. But he's been work he's been working at Claris on the server team for about the last year. Okay. Um, so he's kind of this is his personal project, but he's now on the inside. And some of what he's doing ultimately is making some of the data API better because of the knowledge that he'd already gained for this kind of connection to the data API. So there are some improvements in the next version of FileMaker Server that come little tiny improvements that are because Louis on the inside pushing for the, the kind of changes that will make it better for us as developers. 
yeah, that was really that is really impressive stuff. Just wow. <laughs> Thanks for showing it. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, John. That was that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm, I think at this point we declare the virtual bar open. Um, I'm I'm off to order order another yet another Raspberry Pi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just a quick one before people disappear, if anyone's going to disappear. Please do look at the, the website and um, vote on what you want to or offer up something to talk uh, at the next one. Um, there's, a, there's a little section on the website to do that, fmbug.org.uk. Um, so many of these ideas were on there. Not many people voted, but the greatest some people did. Um, and I think straight into the bar, if people want to go and get something to eat, drink, that's fine. Um, we've got a suggested discussion. I know Gary wanted to talk about uh, Paris Engage, but I think lots of us also want to talk to John more. <laughs> and, I agree. Uh, I think everyone, everyone's going to yeah. quiz John and Ian, I think, as well. So um, I think we'll be both of it. But um, I, I just want to add as well, if, if any of you are talking about we like the event online, please put it out on the socials, talk to everyone, try and get more links to us. We want to increase the numbers to this event. And um, we're lucky enough to have great speakers that come along and then present at these events. And we want to get the numbers up, really. We want to get more, more exposure is, to it. Is, is there a specific hashtag you want? You guys want to use? Uh, we've been using the hashtag FMBug, which we use everywhere, anyhow, because it's unique. Um, so I'd, I'd use hashtag FMBug if, if you put on anything on the socials, that will do. I'm I'm usually on Twitter and um, in, uh, LinkedIn more than anything. Uh, so, yeah, just use those and that, that'll work fine. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and thank you very much for those who spoke today. Brilliant. All of you, yeah. brilliant. Brilliant. Really, really good. So, great, great event. Um, and yes, I'll be sticking around for the virtual bar as always. <laughs> <laughs> and for during, you, I don't know if you've eaten, mate, but I've managed to eat during the session. So I was watching. So I'll, I'll, I'll <clears> cover the I, I, people I, I, and I, stuff I, I, where you go and get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, uh, oh, by the way, this, all the sessions are recorded now, and they they go up on the website and they go up on the uh, YouTube channel. So, um, so yeah, if if you missed anything, you want to go over the stuff. John John's thing was so fast, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I might want to watch the video. Um.